You know, pastors, lay people, scholars, all of us, you know, we wrestle with theological questions. And, and part of what I hope is that Firebrand provides some resources so that we can think through difficult theological questions from within our own tradition. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Firebrand Podcast. I'm Maggie Elmer, and I am here with David Watson and Matt Reynolds. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, Maggie. Hello. Um, Unfortunately, Scott cannot be with us for this episode. We miss him, and he'll be back with us very soon. Yeah, he he is dealing with a family issue and a relative who's sick in... Colorado right now. So pray for the Kisker family, please. Yes, absolutely. But on today's episode of the Firebrand podcast, we are talking about why Firebrand podcast. Now, David, you wrote an article when we launched the magazine called Why Firebrand. Yeah. And basically, I wanted to start Firebrand. I mean, Firebrand wasn't called Firebrand, but Something like this was part of the original vision of Spirit and Truth, um, to have kind of a teaching component, um, more of a higher-end teaching component to the ministry. And so I was looking around at kind of what was going on in other traditions, and, you know, I'm not a Gospel Coalition guy, but the Gospel Coalition puts out a lot of substantive content. Um, Whether you like it or not, um, a lot of this is more intellectually serious stuff for public consumption than one often gets in the Methodist world, and the Wesleyan world, I should say. And then um, you look at something that like Word on Fire mm-hmm. with the Roman Catholics. Again, that's an attempt to sort of um, engage the broader culture in conversations about faith with an evangelistic intent. And so I wanted to do something like that for Wesleyans. I wanted there to be a resource where Wesleyans uh, could get their ideas out into the public sphere for consumption to sort of um, raise the level, I don't know if I would say raise the level of discourse, but um, uh, serve as an equipping ministry for the church. You know, pastors, lay people, scholars, all of us, you know, we wrestle with theological questions. And and part of what I hope is that Firebrand provides some resources so that we can think through difficult theological questions from within our own tradition. So, and this is another, a further expression of that goal. Well, in conversations with you and Matt, um, it, you know, one of the things that we talked about doing was kind of bringing that teaching component of Spirit and Truth all under the banner of Firebrand. Mm -hmm. So the podcast that you and Scott and I did for five and a half years, um, this is basically the sequel to that. Yeah. uh, That was Plain Truth, the Holy Spirited podcast, and uh, that's going to be Firebrand podcast, more explicitly a part of the equipping ministry of spirit and truth. Um, we're also bringing the pastor's theology seminar under the banner of spirit and truth, which Justice Hunter does every year. And, and that's uh, a fantastic opportunity. This year, we're going to be looking at the work of William J. Abraham and the pastor's theology seminar. So if you can make it, I know you're, uh, it's going to be a great experience. So, and is there anything else coming under the Firebrand <laughs> banner right now? For the moment, uh, th- That's I think it. those <laughs> are the things. You know, you have Firebrand Magazine, yeah. of course, and then the podcast and the Firebrand Theology Seminar. Yeah, so, so, you know, in conversation, it just made sense to kind of bring all these things under one umbrella. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, Matt, when you were, I know that you talk about this a lot, with Spirit and Truth, you talk about the desire for a sort of a a bridge between maybe what broadly, sort of generally speaking, has been bifurcated in the past, which is the intellectual tradition and then the practical sort of living out of the church. So could you just talk a little bit about how Firebrand sort of fits into that equation? And Yeah. 
Well, for me, this is um, this kind of gets at the best of our heritage in the Wesleyan tradition, really the combination of heart and head, um, th- you know, rich theology with um, spirit-filled practice. And you know, if I go back all the way to the sort of genesis of spirit and truth, um, I know I've shared this on other platforms, but perhaps uh, folks here haven't heard it. I, when the Lord first kind of just laid this on my heart, this idea to to have a ministry, a renewal kind of ministry, it was really it was about equipping the local church, both laity and clergy, um, not in something new, but in in the historic faith, and then helping them practically take steps of living that out in evangelism and discipleship and and an openness to spirit-filled living. And uh, at the time, David and and I were just becoming friends and eating lunch together. And and so when I first, he was one of the very first people that I kind of mentioned this to. And part of the, when he shared his heart and even the name Spirit and Truth, you know, he shared his his hope um, that he had already been dreaming about to have this kind of an equipping ministry that really addresses the life of the mind within the Wesleyan tradition and helps people to kind of understand um, both our roots and how to think about contemporary issues through a serious Orthodox Wesleyan lens. Mm. And so uh, one of the ideas that we talked about, uh, you know, in that initial kind of brainstorm meeting was um, both the kind of going from church to church as we do with Spirit and Truth and doing hands-on equipping in these things, but then also um, putting together resources, in particular some kind of a journal or, or online magazine that could serve as a platform for this. And um, like David mentioned, the Gospel Coalition earlier, which has a, become a rich resource for those in the Reformed tradition, there really wasn't anything like that in the Wesleyan family. And so... Espe- especially not for more traditionally minded, like yeah. theologically orthodox or theologically traditional um, Methodists. Yeah. And it was getting harder to get those kinds of viewpoints published in United Methodist publications at the time. Yeah. For me, this kind of like, I guess one way I would wrap it up, just my own um, kind of thoughts about the, the genesis of it. At the heart of Spirit and Truth, you know, is this desire for holistic renewal in the church. And one of the ways that we've tried to think about that, one of the lenses that I feel like God has helped clarify our work for us, is through one of the famous quotes that John Wesley, uh, you know, gets quoted on all the times, especially in contemporary Methodist world, because of the way it seems so prophetic. And it's that quote um, when he, he kind of, looks into the future and says, you know, he's not afraid that a people called Methodist should ever cease to exist, but only that they would become a dead sect, having the former religion without the power. Mm -hmm. And this will inevitably be the case unless they hold fast to both the doctrine, the spirit, and the discipline with which they first set out. And as I reflected on that in my own life and as we were starting Spirit and Truth, I think there's something really beautiful in that three-part, um, framework that Wesley offers in that quote, doctrine, you know, the things that we believe and teach, spirit, the way in which we, uh, the spirit by which we live and cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and then Mm -hmm. discipline, the actual ways that we order our lives to live out that faith. Um, When you look at revival across the history of the church, the the revivals that are sustained include all of those things. Yeah. A recapturing of the, the historic teaching of the church, a cooperation with the Spirit of God, a yieldedness to the Spirit, and then practical ordering, like bringing people into groups and uh, teaching people to how to live out the life in tangible tangible ways. And when when you see revival history where things kind of go off the rails, it's usually... Um, it's it's expressions that have parts of those one of those three things missing, you know, or overemphasized. Yeah, and so for spirit and truth, uh, firebrand in some sense is kind of the uh, the truth side of that equation. Is that it's kind of a banner or um, you know a, a holding tank for the ministry initiatives that help us get at how do we how do we pass on the historic faith within a Wesleyan tradition in a way that um, 
you know, allows us to live faithful Christian lives, but also helps to point people, you know, back to the to the resources that our tradition has to offer in hopes of renewing the church. Amen. Yeah, I I think that you know, we we've before the podcast we were talking a lot about the as we're recording this, there is a revival going on at Asbury University that we're celebrating and uh, we just praise God that He's moving uh, in in this moment among those those young people, and what I would love to see is that to spread out to a lot of different places, um, in the way that something like the Toronto revival spread to a lot of different places. I I want to see um, there were pockets of renewal and revival in North America, but I want to see a much broader revival. I want to see a new Great Awakening in america and i think if there is one that it will radiate out to other parts of the world um in fact though i think probably to the extent that an awakening happens in america just to qualify what i said um it's going to be that we have finally caught on to what god is doing in the global south and has been doing for some time and um the spread of Christianity, the rapid spread of Christianity in these areas. But part of the renewal of North American Methodism or North American Christianity is going to have to be a theological mm-hmm. renewal. Yeah. I think we have expected in the church too little of the people in our congregations. We don't really expect them to... Um, uh, we too often do not expect lay people in the congregations to think at a deep theological level and that's a mistake Mm -hmm. i think people in uh, churches are hungry Mm -hmm. for something more than um you know five simple ways jesus makes your life happy or something like that Uh, newsflash (laughs) jesus We'll do a lot of things for you, but he won't always make your life happy. I'm not, hap- I'm not sure happy is his main goal. No, for you, happy is not the goal. <laughs> and or, you know, or just something like this. Um, yeah. I think people want to know who this Jesus is at a deeper level, who who the God is whom we're worshiping. And you know, I I um, I always hear Bishop Robert Barron talk, the Roman Catholic Bishop uh, Robert Barron talking about. You know, don't dumb down the gospel. Yeah. Um, it's okay to um, expect more from people in our churches. And he was talking about um, a girl that, uh, a child he met, who basically gave him, um, I, I think, it, I can't remember if it was like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, but like the whole saga rundown with all the different right. names and everything yeah. like that. And and he's like, you know what? If she can remember those things, she can remember yeah. the stories in the Bible. Heck yeah. You know? Absolutely. And so the people in our churches, you know, uh, there are a lot of really smart people. There are a lot of really hungry people in our churches. So why don't we up our theological game in the churches? And that's one of the things that I think is just going to have to happen. Now, part of that is going to be that we, as leaders in the church, are going to have to ourselves up our theological game, right? We're going to have to begin. I just I just did a talk in Lubbock, Texas, and at the uh, GMC convening conference there, and the idea of the talk was everything is theological. Yeah. There, in the Christian life, there's nothing that we say or do that in some way does not have theological significance. Every moment of our lives has some kind of meaning to it, but we don't always think of it that way because we tend to compartmentalize. We're, we're taught in, in the West to sort of compartmentalize the spiritual parts of my life. Or these, these are the parts of my life that relate to faith and relate to God or, relate, or religious or something like that, and these are the other normal parts of my life or something yeah. like that. But that's, a, that's, first of all, a very new concept, and secondly, I think it's a very flawed concept, because if you're a Christian, God claims your whole life, and you need to begin to think about everything from how you spend your time, to how you spend your money, to your marriage, to the shows that you watch on TV, you know, all of these things, to to what you're looking at on the internet, to et cetera, et cetera, all of these things have theological significance for your life. In other words, they have 
significance for your relationship, uh, your life in relationship to the God who created and saved you? Yeah, I, I just have this deep conviction that um, what you believe about God affects everything about you. Yes, Amen. it does. You know, I think it was A.W. Tozer who said, mm-hmm. what comes into a man's mind when he thinks about God is the most important thing about him. And um, I think there's truth in that. I, yeah. I think because how you think about the supernatural, how you think, who you think God is, who you think Jesus is, and why he came, and all of these things, it changes practical ways that you choose to live out your life. And this is where I get really uneasy with what I think has been uh, typical in popular Christian circles in recent decades is this kind of, I think you mentioned it earlier, Maggie, this kind of bifurcating between the theological and the practical. And I I mean, even recently, I just saw someone uh, on Twitter posting something about it, just kind of sparked this again in my mind about... We, we treat them like they're two completely different worlds. Yeah, yeah. And that's just not true. You know, like our our beliefs are best observed by the way that they're lived out. You can see what someone actually believes by the way that they live, you know. And mm-hmm. the two things are not, you can't just s- separate uh, them. And even the ways that we choose to order the church, the decisions that we make about worship, the things that we do, if you know, for church leaders that are listening, the practical decisions about how we organize discipleship and programming and things in our church, all of those have theological implications, and all of them are teaching people something about God. And it may not be uh, in congruence with the the content that's coming out of our mouths. We may be undermining that even by the practical ways that we're going about it. And that's why I think thinking carefully about our theology and its relationship to our practices as an integrated whole is crucially important for the church. You know, it, it, this is really interesting for me to listen to um, because <clears throat> I think that um, it's it's very hard to live at that level of awareness, you know. And but I but I see the implications of this statement all the time, especially when we travel, yeah. a, and you see it in. Um, so when we travel with spirit and truth, we go into churches and, and we're outsiders and outsiders in a community always have a particular advantage because, um, nothing is white noise. We see everything. Yeah. And, um, there's a couple things that, that I am always, uh, struck by. One is, is the Holy Spirit is alive and real and he will talk to you. And he, nothing is hidden from him. Yeah. Absolutely zero things are hidden from the yeah. Holy Spirit. Our team walks into churches and we sit and pray and we get things about those churches right away. Yeah. And um, so there's that. But the other thing is this, is that we, I've seen this happen over and over and over again. Shepherds will sit with their people and they have a They develop a particular overarching narrative about who their people are, what their people are willing to do, what they're not willing to do. And one of the amazing things that happens is, is we come in and we do things that are often very uncomfortable for people. And the shepherd has this opportunity to see, oh, I'm, I might be wrong about that. I might be expecting too little. And so I love what you're saying, David. You know, we need to have more expectations, not only in terms of intellectually what we expect people to engage in their faith life, but also just what we expect people to do as Christians. Yeah. There was one thing you said, David, that I want to go back to, and it was just like a little throwaway phrase. This idea, you said something was a new idea. And um, what is the significance or, or, or implication of the idea that, that, that it, that it's a new idea that that somehow we can compartmentalize our lives like that's a new idea we don't need to take it on as i mean this this gets into the conversation we've had many times about the philosopher charles taylor and his work a secular age <laughs> you know <laughs> wouldn't be one of our podcasts if we didn't talk about charles taylor mm. it's a good thing there's that we don't have like a drinking game that when you mention charles taylor <laughs> some, bingo some people or, might yeah. yeah we um we may be causing people to sin <laughs> <laughs> but 
you know, the the idea is in Europe in the 1500s, it was impossible not to be a religious person. Yeah. You know, and basically it was impossible not to be a Christian. Everyone was a Christian in Europe in, in or, you know, at least in Western Europe in the 1500s. Mm. And today it's not only possible, but quite likely that people aren't Christians. Why? What's the difference? And so he talks about the development of what he calls secularism. And part of that is just, um, it, it's, he uses a term called the social imaginary, okay? And that is, it's, a, it's, it's almost a way, it's similar to talking about worldview. It's the sort of thing that the world that we're immersed in allows us to envision and imagine, okay? Mm-hmm. And our social imaginary is shaped by all kinds of things that keep faith at arm's length. You know, for example... Uh, in my training as a biblical scholar, you know, I'm I'm taught, I was I was basically taught, uh, kind of a, uh, a a mode of doing historical work that does not uh, privilege Christian religious claims. Now, this is one of the um, major contentions in Van Harvey's book, The Historian and the Believer. Mm. And that is once you begin to um, affirm theological claims in your work, you're no longer, you are, you are by virtue of that, you are ipso facto, no longer a historian. You're You're doing theology now Mm. or something like that. Once you begin that kind of confessional work, and I just think that's wrong, but it is the way that a lot of people think about the work that they do. And... You know, you you could en- envision a scenario, for example, where in a secular workplace, two people are talking about how much they love Jesus or how much he's changed their life together uh, just by the water cooler, and someone else files a complaint uh, with HR about that uh, because somehow they feel threatened by it or something like that. And so we're, we're, we, especially now in our current moment, I think faith is really, people are trying very hard to push faith out of the public sphere, at least Christianity out of the public sphere. And, but that, that goes way back into the period of the European Enlightenment, where people are starting to make epistemological moves related to how our claims about God and what God has done in Jesus Christ relate to the other spheres of knowledge that we have, like science. Hmm. That's that's a long and winding answer uh, to your question. But, but the short answer is, we just think about the place of faith in our lives differently than people did, you know, 500 years ago. Yeah. It, we just do. And, and there, there are long and complex historical reasons for that. I think the fact that we think differently about it now often does not occur to people. I think a lot of us suffer from this is yeah. just what I've always known. Just like a fish in water. You just, yeah. That's, that's, that's our that, social imaginary. Yeah, yeah, that's the social imaginary. When that's yeah. your reality, uh, you don't know that there's anything different than that. Yeah. And you kind of assume that that's the right way to look at the world. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And part of... You know, one of the hobby horses I've been riding for a while now, and there are several, <laughs> but one of them is that we have to teach people a different way of thinking in the church, not just a different way of living or something like that. We actually have, and not just what to think, but a different way of thinking in the life of the church so that um, so that we think Christianly. I, was, I, I don't know if I talked about this on a podcast or not. But you the, talk about this on almost every podcast. But, but this particular book by Harry oh, Blamires oh. called The Christian Mind. Yes, you talk. Yes. That, that Drew McIntyre uh, got me on to. And um, I listened to this book while I was in Cuba, and then I bought it in print. And I think it's, it's an important work written in 1963 by one of the students of C.S. Lewis. Yeah. But he, he just talks about how most of the time, this is in England in 1963, we don't think about things Christianly. Mm-hmm. You know, what we think of, you know, for example, education or something like that. You know, we just think, well, um, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic have have a place in education now, but 
Um, but the set of faith claims that Christians believe, and this is in an ostensibly Christian nation, England, 1963, you know, the set of faith claims that we make don't have a place in that. Now I think we're starting to see that education, more often than we think, has ideological components to it. And that's kind of where some of the culture wars are raging, is which ideology should take root in these things. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, um, then why shouldn't we be simply explicit about incorporating Christianity into the education of our children if we are Christians, Mm -hmm. right? Because kids are going to get some ideology from their schooling. Yes. I was just going to say, I have this conversation all the time. I mean, you want to talk about a hobby horse. Homeschooling is one of mine. But one of the the conversations I, I've had with a friend of mine who is who is agnostic or atheist is she always, her thing is, is public school is neutral. Yeah. And, and I said, no, public school is not neutral because um, there is no There's neutrality. There's nothing that's neutral. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, yeah right? there's no neutrality. Yeah. You are learning a worldview in public school, and it is one without God. Yeah. Right, and, and you're being indoctrinated into a certain ideology. Absolutely. You know, some I understand what people say when they distinguish between education and indoctrination. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that's one of the reasons that I'm for a kind of liberal education, in, in liberal in the sense that you expose people to different sets of ideas. Yeah, the classical idea of the liberal arts education. Yeah, and, and so they can learn to think critically, uh, which is a very important skill to have. Um, but at some level, education always involves indoctrination. Even that kind of liberal education, you're, you're inculcating values into people. You're saying it's important to engage ideas that you don't necessarily agree with. Yeah. That's, a, that's a value system, and that's, mm-hmm. that's connected to a whole network of other ideas. And I do think it's good to inculcate that into people, to help them to internalize uh, those values. But nevertheless, that is, in its own way, a form of indoctrination. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I think that's right. There's, there is no such thing as sort of ideological neutral. Like, that doesn't exist. Like, Not a thing. Everything that you do is infused with, it's got embedded ideologies in it. So, But I, but I think it's important because... You know, part of the part of the problem with I was just listening to the Get Religion podcast, and Terry Mattingly was talking about this um, about bias in journalism, for example, and is journalism a religion? You know that 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 was the question that he was was talking about, and he was saying the problem is a lot of people acknowledge now that. It's it's very you know that reporters never go into stories where their mind is kind of a blank slate and just report the facts, but um, but it's important to acknowledge what our biases are so that as we uh, just so that we can be honest about it so people can kind of know where we're coming from so you know like when I write I'm almost always writing explicitly as a Christian and I I don't. You know, I don't hide that fact. I don't, and so yeah. people can know this is where Watson is coming from. These are the kinds of things he presupposes. Uh, you can imagine what those are, and then judge judge those on their merits. Yeah. You know, and if and if you don't share in those presuppositions, the the article might be of less interest to you. But I think that that in education, what a lot of people are seeing now is that um, there's always this, like you say, there's always this kind of bias. There are always these kinds of ideologies that are at work in what's being taught. And so as Christians, we need to incorporate our own vision of the world and right and wrong and how things work into the educational curriculum. It doesn't mean that we sort of hermetically seal ourselves off from other fields of knowledge, right? Like we don't seal ourselves off from the best scientific work that's available or literary criticism or something like that, but that we keep in mind what our primary commitments are as we do these things. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, this is actually, this is shifting gears just a little bit, but as I'm thinking about um, kind of the the overall question that we started with, why firebrand? Mm -hmm. And, why do, why does a renewal ministry like Spirit and Truth and equipping 
ministry have a component that is so focused on theology you know whether it's audio like this podcast or the magazine etc and i'm thinking back to what you alluded to earlier with the asbury revival that's happening as we speak uh, at this point that we're recording it's been going uh several a few days. days yeah and uh to me that's an example of the way in which our sort of worldview or the way in which we think about life theologically has an impact in practical ways. For example, I've seen different kinds of reaction to that. And some of the skeptic- skeptical kind of reaction, I think, is driven because there's sort of an embedded sort of view. Their view of Christianity doesn't include what you were mentioning earlier and like to talk about this sense of divine action. Mm-hmm. Their Their view of God is not one where they... Uh, imagine that this is the kind of thing that God does where he sort of interacts in tangible ways with humans in in this kind of a setting. And so when, you know, if we have people in our churches that have this kind of embedded theological perspective that maybe they don't even recognize where God is is really more of a concept uh, than one who has agency and active in their life, then it actually, it affects you practically in the the kinds of experiences that you're willing to entertain, the kind of things that you're uh, open to pursuing. And that has genuine impact in how your life is lived as a Christian. So the life of the mind, how we understand our faith, is integrally linked to the way in which we experience our faith and live it out. Yeah, I agree with that. And also, it helps... um it helps the people in the church when they come across people on Twitter or Facebook or writers or something like that who are skeptical about such yeah. things. It's not yeah. that, you know, when we look at something like the Asbury Revival, it's not like we completely turn off our critical faculties or anything like that. But it it is not surprising to me that a revival is happening yeah. in a place at Asbury University that has for generations, been dedicated to uh, education in the Christian tradition, the worship of the one true God, a Wesleyan vision of the faith, a high view of Scripture. And when these young people come forward in a spirit of repentance, in a kind of figurative sackcloth and ashes Mm -hmm. for their sins, why is it surprising then that God would move with power in such a context. That sounds to me very much like other revivals that have happened. It's, it sounds exactly like what it says in Scripture. If only my people will repent, r- yeah. return, call out for right. me. Yeah. Right. And so when there is that spirit of repentance and seeking God, I don't think God is stingy with Not himself. Not at all. You no. know, right. God it wants to pour himself out upon the church in new revival. But I think parts of the church, for whatever reason, don't want that. Yeah. You know, and I, I've said this in other places, but it's one of the things I love about you, David, is the uh, the combination of uh, serious intellect with an openness to the supernatural. And maybe I like it because uh, I have this personal appeal to that kind of combination as well. I mean... You know, just growing up, like I was, uh, you know, I was a good student and I was serious about learning and all of that. And yet I started to have some experiences where I saw God moving in supernatural ways. And yet I just became convinced along the way that I didn't have to turn my brain off to be open to that stuff. In fact, that there was actually great continuity uh, between the historic faith that, you know, the more that I, I studied it and these kind of experiences of God's power. And um, that's part of the reason I'm so passionate about having the combination of kind of our experiential equipping in spirit and truth wedded to uh, resources like what we're trying to offer through Firebrand because the two things do go together. Yes, and these are these are things that have to be retaught in much of the North American church, right? We have to yeah. teach people about the nature of, of the God whom we worship, that this God is not powerless, this God is not an absentee landlord, yeah. this God really does love us mm. and wants to move in our lives. Yeah. 
And it's not always going to look like this Asbury revival. Sometimes it will. But, uh, but it, 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 can, it can look like a lot of different things. But I remember uh, I was on the staff of a, of a United Methodist Church many years ago, and I was going to teach a Sunday school class, and uh, I was talking about this, this Sunday school class had a diagram of the Wesleyan quadrilateral up on the wall, Scripture, oh. Tradition, Reason, Experience. My favorite. And we're gonna we're gonna do so many firebrand podcasts on the Wesleyan quadrilateral, <laughs> oh, Maggie. You're false. gonna love it. You're gonna love it. <laughs> no. But I started t- talking with before it was before the class. The leader of the class was there. I started talking with her about it, and she looked at me and she's like, "Why can't Methodists be uh, the people who simply believe whatever they want?" And I didn't even know where to start with engaging that uh, question. But part of it is, um, if Methodists are the people who believe whatever they want, what does that say about our commitment to truth? Yeah. It means we don't have one. Yeah, if you can believe anything you want, you actually believe nothing. Yeah. That's right. As a, as a community. As a community. You believe yeah. nothing. And so... I mean, and there there are a host of other problems about that. What if I believe things about God that lead me to to be a morally bad person? What if I believe things about God that lead me to become a white supremacist? You know, what if I believe things about God um, that lead me to be an authoritarian um, husband and father or something yeah. like that? Yeah. You know, and, and so I think once you begin to press on those issues, once you begin to drill down a little bit into these issues, people begin to see, oh yeah, that's not really right. But a lot of people have been formed in the church in such a way as to believe that the set of claims we make about God aren't really that important. And I want to say, no, they really are that important. Mm-hmm. You know, They're really yeah, important. Absolutely. It, as you were talking, I thought, like our culture right now on the one hand the same people who are like <laughs> you should be able to believe whatever you want are exactly the same They're people like, you can't believe <laughs> yeah who are telling very you specific exactly set of what you, you do believe. need yeah. to believe and i'm like there's just there's no logical right. coherence there and, yeah. and that's why i say you know in every religious community every christian community there's an orthodoxy yeah there's always a creed it's just whether you acknowledge it Mm -hmm. or not Mm -hmm. is it a creed that's written down or is it a creed that everyone just kind of assumes right and a lot of times it in many churches it's a creed that everyone kind of assumes you know you have non-creedal traditions like um some conservative evangelical traditions think of themselves as non-creedally uh or non-creedal but if you press them on it the beliefs in the community are going to be you know, very similar to what Christians have claimed yeah. over the centuries, right? Because they don't have an explicit creed, they have an implicit creed that's been shaped by historic Christian beliefs. Yeah. And then in uh, progressive communities, you have different kinds of creeds. There are certain things that are simply assumed to be right and wrong in the community, and woe be unto the one <laughs> who violates yeah. uh, uh, that creed. I remember one time, I, I for a short time, our family attended. It was a very short time, actually. Um, just a month or two, this church that was kind of like a, I don't want to say the tradition, but it's an evangelical church. And um, it was in the season of transition for us. And the the kind of banner of that tradition is like no creed but the Bible. Mm. And uh, But then, then I started, like, I, I met with the pastor a couple of times to ask some uh, sort of doctrinal questions, and then I quickly realized like they got some they got some creeds that you can't get from the Bible. You yeah. know what I mean? That's they, right. Uh, it's so you know that might sound good on a you know banner on the wall, but it doesn't actually do you any good. Yeah. No, that's that's kind of a hyper Protestant understanding of the Bible, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. No creed, but the Bible. Um, I wish I could. I wish I could track down the quote. I heard it was from Erasmus, but I don't think it is. But during the Reformation, somebody said something to the effect of, you you no longer have a pope in Rome, you have a pope on every dunghill. 
Mm. And the idea is that every new Christian leader who comes up becomes the authoritative interpreter of Scripture for that tradition, and there are as many new Christian communities forming as there are these interpreters, Yeah, right? And, and that has been sort of the Protestant malady over the years. Yeah, well, and also all of those various iterations and expressions that breathe kind of their own culture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and this is know. actually, I mean, I hate to keep going back to the same thing. This is part of what I see happen, one of the issues with more revival kind of focused ministries in general, and one of the things that I don't want spirit and truth to be, which is when you become unwed from a theological anchor, yep. when you have no theological anchor, then you your creed is just whatever the whim of the leader is at that moment. That's right. And I've seen, I've been a part of stuff like that where I've seen firsthand just how quickly uh, some, some wacky things can, can happen when it's just, you know, it's sort of like the all experience side, but there's, but you don't, it's all spirit and no truth, right? You've got, you've got no anchor to keep you sort of, you know, in step with the tradition that's been passed down to right, us. Right, mm. right. And and so part of... I do think that Methodists em, do emphasize, historically at least, emphasize tradition in a healthy way. You know, we get that from our Anglican forebears. And tradition is just how we say that at certain points in our history, God has taught us things, or God has so guided our reason that we've come to certain truths that are worth preserving over time. And I think that, that you know, I was reading, I was, I was, I've been writing about the emergence of Methodist liberalism and Borden Parker Bound and these kinds of things. And he has a, a notion of kind of progressive revelation. Uh, he, he says, Scripture is important because it discloses us to us, the, it discloses to us, the revelation of God, and that's where the real inspiration is. It's in the revelation of God. Now, Bowne was a very smart guy. He must have had a very, also, uh, powerful personal presence. Um, he was very influential. But he also says the revelation is ongoing because we keep understanding it more and more fully. And I think, well, that's kind of where you lose me, <laughs> okay, because... I do think that there are periods in history where we come to certain a certain awareness of God, maybe, that we haven't had before. I think, for example, you know, uh, the council, the period uh, from the Council of Nicaea to the Council of Constantinople, when we kind of, the church made some decisions about the nature of Christ, for example, I think was one of those moments. Um, and these do happen in the history of the church, but when those happen, I mean, God is not the author of confusion. If God is still, if we say that God is still speaking, like what is the motto in the UCC church, or at least it was, then we also have to acknowledge that God has spoken. And if God has spoken in the past, then we should pay attention to what he said. And so there's where I think, I, I've been thinking about writing an article for Firebrand on this. There's where I think the real tension, if you, get right, if you want to get right to the point, the basic point, the most basic point of tension um, in the Methodist wars that are going on right now and have been going on for some time, it's, it's this tension between a vision of uh, progressive understanding on the one hand and historic understanding on the other. Mm. The idea that at some points God has has revealed things to us or so guided our reason in such a way as to teach us things that um, teach us truths that we need to hang on to over time. It's not like all of these truths are continually evolving to the point where what we believed before is almost unrecognizable as our belief now. Is that, am I making any sense on this? Yeah. I yeah. Think, uh, okay. Absolutely. All right. Cause I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> Your is... rambling is way different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know. So I may or may write, may or may not write that article at some point or some week. If we have, if we're low on articles, I, oh, we're having a slow week. No, that, that never happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> nope. 
Yeah. Um, so here's just a sort of a gear shift and super practical question. We firebrand has grown, and um, I I feel really fortunate to have watched that grow. I mean, what do you think, David? What are what are your hopes for the future of firebrand, the magazine, the podcast, just whatever you know, anything under that banner? What I hope Firebrand will do is um, I just want it to have a positive influence upon the Wesleyan movement broadly conceived. And that means, you know, the United Methodist Church, the Global Methodist Church, uh, the Holiness Movement, Pentecostalism, Black Methodism, you know, the, the whole big family. I hope that Firebrand can just provide some resources for people you know, I, I don't think that Firebrand is ever going to be, you know, Christianity today, you know, and have that, you know, all what? of these subscribers everywhere. Maybe, I don't know, you know, it's it's all up to God. But, you know, um, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of subscribers, I don't know how many subscribers, lots, they, lots and lots of, mm. you know, be famous like that. What I want to do is resource the Wesleyan movement. Yeah. And I think if we can resource the Wesleyan movement in ways that have an effect— on how people think about Christian doctrine and Christian practice, then I think um, it will be a success. And, you know, Dale messaged me and said that Dale Coulter, uh, who recently wrote the Firebrand Big Read on Pentecostal and charismatic Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, just Great wrote, article. Yeah, it was a fantastic article, very detailed. Mm -hmm. Um, but th this is an article that's now going to be used uh, in a seminary classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what I think, well, okay, good. If it's getting into the hands of people like that, if they're looking at it and saying, okay, this is what I want my students to learn, and these students in turn are going to be go out and be pastors and teach people in the churches, that's the kind of influence that I want Firebrand to have. Amen. I want to just uh, take a moment. As you were as you're saying that, and just uh, say a public thank you to you, David, for all of your hard work, and Maggie to you as well, because the two of you have put in more hours on Firebrand than any other human, <laughs> and uh, so people need to know that it's um, this is a magazine that has um, one part-time staff member in that uh, a piece of Maggie's role with Spirit and Truth includes. Uh, managing Firebrand, and beyond that, it's all volunteers, yeah. and um, and and it's really it is remarkable. I mean, it's become uh, a resource that a lot of people are using. You put together, David, um, a tremendous cast of characters on the editorial, editorial board. board. I mean, some really we've got great people. Some of there. the top oh, yeah. scholars in the Wesleyan world are on this editorial board, and um, yeah, from I'm thinking back to the time. Uh, we joke about this sometimes, but that that first website that you sent me when we first <laughs> yeah. started this it was so bad. Sorry, I'm s well. It could it needed a little. There are a variety of gifts. It right? needed a little improvement. <laughs> that's why we. That's some are gifted with web design. Yeah. Some are not. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. We all can Bring partner a together. To the table. Yeah. But it, from where you know, from that Genesis idea, from where it started to where we are now, because of both of your. Um, impact in both of your investment in it uh i'm just grateful i'm grateful that each of you have contributed and you're having you know it's it's serving the church because of your your influence and investment so thank you well uh thanks for believing in it and getting behind the project and i also want to lift up yeah. suzanne nicholson and ryan, ryan danker, danker. Yeah, uh for they, sure. so the three of us on this podcast right now and um Dr. Nicholson and Dr. Danker, yeah. that's the Firebrand lead team, and that's where most of the editorial work happens. We, we do outsource articles to members of the editorial board uh, sometimes, and that's extremely helpful. But um, You guys really do the heavy lifting on editing and, and copy editing and all of that stuff, and, and it gets exciting around <laughs> Monday at 2, 3 in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> It does, but, but Sue and Ryan have really yeah. uh, contributed a lot. We're grateful uh, for that work. And with regard to this podcast, um, which is, uh, you know, the 
the next the grown up version <laughs> expression <laughs> moved of up to the, uh, the plain truth podcast the grown up table you know, I know I am a little sad that we got rid of the Muppet music. No, you're not. I am. I mean, I tried to get some more kind of cheery music, and Maggie didn't didn't want cheery, cheery music. Cheery music? What? So I do. I feel there's one other thing. Hold on. I have to say one other thing because I feel like I wouldn't be doing my job as the president of Spirit of Truth if I didn't say this. If there are folks who are listening to this, if you if Firebrand has been a blessing to you, and if this podcast has been a blessing to you, uh, we could use your partnership. Uh, Spirit and Truth is a 501c3 that has no institutional sort of tie. It doesn't. Uh, all of our ability to do ministry. Yeah. What are you laughing I'm about? I'm saying yes. Send us money. Yeah. I mean, well, we only can exist. The, the magazine... And all of our resourcing, the equipping that we do in the local church only happens because of generous individuals and churches who believe in this vision of renewal in the church mm. and want to personally participate in that. And so if, if that's something uh, that the Lord would lead you to, um, you can go over to firebrandmag.com and click on the give uh, or donate button at the top, and um, we'd be greatly appreciative of your partnership. And before we end the podcast, I want to give a shout out to Scott. We're missing you, Scott, yeah. and we look forward to having you back on the podcast. And we hope everything's okay with your family. So bless you, and we'll be in prayer for your family. Yeah. Amen. All right, that's been our podcast for today. You guys, if you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button. And the highest compliment you can pay to us is when you share this podcast. Rate, like the podcast, helps people find it. All right, we'll talk to you in the next episode. Thank you.